Good morning. All right, everyone's excited for the first time. Good morning. Good morning. There's the feedback. Yeah. Well, Joel said he had a short exhortation for you um, this morning. I wasn't where he was going to introduce me that way, but um, that's okay. I appreciate that, Joel. Before we get started this morning, let's go into prayer. Father, we thank you for enabling us to be together, though it looks a little different. We're in awe of your graciousness to us, and I would pray that we would find even just the smallest mercies out of these situations. I ask that every heart would be opened, and that you would attend to your word with your spirit. You promised that it would not return void, and that's what I call on you today to do, Father. Open up hearts. Capture men as your own. Keep us from error this morning. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is the second service, and uh, I was going to do one of them in Latin. Guess which one you picked? I don't know Latin, so you guys are safe. Open up your Bibles to Genesis 3. I'm getting, do I need to shut this one off? Open up to Genesis 3 and 4. We're going to spend a lot of time this morning. I probably don't need to tell most of you this, but in case you didn't notice, we are in a war. There couldn't be two more opposing sides. One side seeks after life and liberty and justice. The other, death, enslavement, and anarchy. One side fights for freedom, and the other, fear. One side promotes and gives hope, and the other instills and incites despair. While one side stands for truth, the other is involved in great deception. Indeed, whether we realize it this morning, as we sit here, or whether we're asleep at night, whether we take note during the day, or just do our jobs and try and get through living our lives, I tell you that at all times, agents on both sides are at work, plotting attacks, gathering intelligence. One side is using the weapons and the defense that they've been given. The other side is desperately seeking to weaponize every tool and idea at their disposal. One side is seeking to destroy all that is right and good. And it is no overstatement, I suggest to you, that not only is our very way of life threatened, but oftentimes our very lives themselves hang in the balance. But I will say this, unlike probably every speech that you've heard this year, every college address you may have been part of, every political ad, every all-hands meeting at work, I'm not going to stand here and say the words in these unprecedented times. Because, folks, these times are not unprecedented at all. And the war that I'm talking about is probably not the one that you're thinking of. We call that bait and switch. Now, this war has been raging for a long, long time. So if you can forgive me for that bait and switch, I promise to do what every person who ever stands up before you in preaching the Word of God ought to do, which is tell you the truth. I said the war that I've been referring to has been raging for a long, long time, from the very beginning of mankind, actually. So if you're in Genesis 3, that's how far back this goes. Listen to this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of any fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw it, that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together 
and made themselves loincloths. And after this, of course, God punishes them. And this is what he says to the serpent. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Now listen to this. Here's the key portion for this morning. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And so right there in Genesis 3, we have a declaration from God that enmity exists between the offspring of the woman and the offspring of the evil one. That until this war is settled once and for all, and no more remnants of conflict exist, it would rage between these two lines. This is going to be unpopular. But I want you to understand that Genesis is not primarily, hear me here, primarily a science book. Oh, well, now you go too far. Keep it together. Hold on. Just listen. Is there a science in there? Absolutely it is. But if we look at Genesis, let alone any book of the Bible like that, we miss the point of God's story. I submit to you, now hear me, yes, creation was a real event. Adam and Eve were real people. The garden was a real place. There was a real fall with real consequences that happened. If you notice, the Bible never stops itself in the narrative to try and prove that to you, does it? It just states it. Now, this book is primarily about God. And while it does teach us about the history of mankind and the beginning of the world, we cannot and, in fact, should not divorce it from the rest of the Bible. Because to do so would be to miss the point and the lesson that it has for us about the situation that humanity was put into and that we find ourselves in today. Now, because of the work of a supernatural character in the garden, we see the chaos he caused even today. And I want you to understand who this character is, who led our first parents into death. This creature was not just a talking snake, making his offspring a bunch of talking snake people. And yes, I watched both conventions on TV. And yes, for those wondering, there's a problem here who this character is. Now this creature, the Hebrew word, is actually nakash. You'll hear that often this morning. And it can and often does mean most likely serpent, but it also means more. It can mean shining or bright or glimmering, like the reflection of bronze, if it's translated as a verb. And if it's translated as an adjective that stands in for a noun, we would translate it the shining one, the bright one. Now commentators tell us it's perfectly acceptable to translate it this way, this serpent, this nakash we've heard so much about, is the shining one. Meaning that this was no mere snake. It was a supernatural, heavenly being. And what went on in the Garden of Eden, due to his shenanigans, was more than just a simple lie, a simple deception. It was an attack on the pinnacle of God's creation, which is mankind. Why? Why did he do this? Because man was the entity that was given dominion over the earth to rule and subdue it. You remember? And then Nakash was angry about it. Remember, he's an arrogant one. He thought he should rule the world that God created. And so this entity who masquerades as an angel of light put into motion a plan to destroy that which was called man. You see these illusions all over the Bible. I'm just going to give you one here about the attitude that we find in Isaiah 14. It's a poetic, poetic way of connecting the king of Babylon to the attitude of Satan. Isaiah says this, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. He wanted the spot, and God gave it to man. Now we're told at the beginning of chapter 3 that the shining one, the serpent, was cunning and crafty, but he is not God. doesn't matter how crafty he is, how cunning he is, God is still God. His presumption that he should rule the world, the Lord created, 
And his arrogance led him to be cast out. He was literally cut down to the ground, but not before he initiated a devious plan to destroy mankind. But I want you to, to, to notice something. It was not his deception of Eve, or even the assumption of Adam failing to do his duty and keep the garden safe, that he relied on for his plan to work. Those were the means to the end. Now what he was counting on may come as a surprise. This Nakash, the serpent, was counting on God's promise. That should sound strange, right? That probably does sound strange, and why? Well, the serpent put his hope in God's promise, but it's in fact the truth. And how do I say that? Because he knew what the Lord God had promised. What he had declared, should Adam and Eve break that sacred command, the Lord God promised death. He was hoping for God to carry out justice. God, you promised, now get them. He was counting on God's promise to destroy them. Back in Genesis 2, we read, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so Nakash looks at that and says, That's the promise. If you're a righteous and holy judge, like you say you are, now you have to take them out. The serpent wanted to destroy mankind. What better way than to just have their creator do it? He just had to lead them into it. Let God do the work. Once they broke that command. Adam and Eve that day were thrown out of the garden, for sure, and they would eventually die. They would also plunge their posterity into this war that was mentioned as part of the curse. However, indeed, there was good news too. Whenever you read Scripture and any story in the Scripture, it always fascinates me that it never really ends with bad news. There's always hope at the end. Always. That the offspring of the woman would crush the head of the serpent and right the wrong, and not just that wrong, every wrong that would follow in the history of the world. So even in the curse, there was hope. And it was that hope from then on throughout the history of the world that makes the dragon, our enemy, rage so terribly before us. And then we find that it took no more than one single generation to see the extended consequence of the war. We find out in Genesis 4, Adam and Eve had a child. And Eve boasted. I don't know if you've ever caught this before, but she's boasting here. I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Who came first in that sentence? I've gotten a man. God just helped. And the boy's name was Cain. Interestingly, his name means spear. Spoiler alert. And in Hebrew, his name sounds like the word forgotten, so Eve is playing on this concept. And so at least from the perspective of Eve, she thinks Cain is the one, the offspring. The weapon that will crush the head of the serpent. Pay attention to the names in the Bible, they're important. And that wasn't the only child they had, however. And with a very almost passive announcement, the Bible says that she also bore his brother Abel. With Cain, the spirit was, I have gotten a man from the help, or with the help of the Lord. And with Abel, it was like, oh yeah, and this other kid. In light of what happens next with these brothers, I find Abel's name to be extremely interesting. And you know what Abel means? It means vapor or breath. How tragically appropriate. Abel's life was but a vapor, a breath, and then it was gone. Does that sound familiar to you? This is what James says. What is your life? For you are a mist, a vapor, a breath that appears for a little time and then vanishes. In other words, your life is an Abel. But I encourage you this morning to spend it like an Abel. And what did he do? He did the right thing. He brought the right offering with the right heart and the right attitude in faith. Now think about that. We know two things about Abel, that he brought an offering and it was regarded by God and that his brother murdered him. The only two things we know about Abel. I've used this before, I'm going to say it again. It's a lesson to us that if you're in a field and you're standing and Cain is coming towards you, you run if you're Abel. I couldn't remember, sorry. 
But think about that. We have entire books of men. I love reading. I love biographies. Pastor Ken loves biographies. We have entire books written about men of faith, biographies that show what they did, their great accomplishments, how they became a pastor at a young age. They preached to thousands upon thousands. They left all they had so they could take the gospel to faraway places, spending their entire life in ministry. But here, all that's said about Abel is that his life is a vapor and he did the right thing. That makes it for a very short obituary, but a very extraordinary one. Ken always jokes about what he wants on his tombstone. I'll take that. Well done, good and faithful servant. So this is the one that has been raging ever since. And though we only have this short chapter, when you think about it, that details what happened, it isn't taken lightly by the rest of Scripture. This is not a one-and-done story. In fact, the two-story of, the, of these brothers, the two lines, one the offspring of the woman and the other the offspring of the evil one, is used often to contrast the righteous and the unrighteous. Listen to how the New Testament talks about them. We should not be like Cain, John says, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Jude says this, Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain. Jesus himself uses this story as an object lesson. And he perfectly sums up the battle between these two lines about the offspring of the evil one and of the righteous. He says this in Matthew, Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some of you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the righteous blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. In fact, to the Jews, calling someone a Cain or comparing them to Cain was about the worst thing you could do. In light of our culture now, we would maybe think of somebody like Hitler. And when you compare someone to Hitler, that's a bad thing. That's how it was for the Jews when you talked to them about Cain. There's one more passage I'm going to mention, but I'll come back to it, and that's Hebrews 12. It says this, And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So clearly the New Testament writers took this and they understood what was happening and they used it. And I want you to note that this is not just an isolated thing. In fact, it helps us understand the entire context of the Bible. Everything from that moment, Genesis 3 through Genesis 4, that was first demonstrated by Cain and Abel, becomes the background for every struggle that exists in the Bible and especially the struggle we find ourselves in now. Indeed, the rest of this book, in one form or another, and especially its climax, is concerned about this war and who wins it. I'm not sure why it is, but the unrighteous always think they can get away with whatever it is they're doing. Actually, no, I, I get it. I have kids. I understand. No sooner did Cain murder his brother than the God who created everything comes to him and questions him, where is Abel your brother? And Cain says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? No repentance, no remorse, not even faking knowledge that he knows what happened. And so the Lord says this, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And so we see the serpent's plan of destroying mankind very evident, don't we? Again, the promise was that through childbearing there would be a seed and he would rescue and deliver from this sin. And so Satan's plan is to destroy that line. And we find in Genesis 4 as Cain destroys Abel. Abel is dead. Does that mean the promise of salvation through childbirth is destroyed as well? We'll see. But now if one commentator puts it this way, that now Cain's punishment is linked to his crime. Cain, if you remember, is a worker of the ground. And now he will no longer be able to cultivate the soil because his brother's blood cries out to God from the ground. You've stained it. Now it will not yield for you. And so we see the curse of Genesis 3 in action. Cain's father, Adam, had said, in pain shall eat of the ground. And now it gets worse for Cain, But that isn't all. 
See, when God created the earth, he created a place that we call Eden. And in that place, he put a garden. It was his sanctuary. It was his home where he interacted with his Lord. But as he was driven from it because of sin, he was forced to leave that sanctuary. And notice the last part of what God tells Cain here. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Not only was the family driven out of the garden, Cain is cursed to be a wanderer. He will have no place, no sanctuary. And that becomes important later on in the story of the Bible. But now we find this interesting phrase in chapter 4. It says this, Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. We're familiar with Nod. I see some of you nodding now. He's supposed to be a wanderer. That was the curse. But instead, he rebels again, and he settles. And he did so in a place in which the Hebrew name means wandering or wanderer, to move to and fro. How's that for irony? A place by which it said, east of Eden. So Adam is driven outside of Eden. Now think about this. The entrance to Eden is on the east, so if you want to enter the sanctuary, you have to go from the west. What does Cain do? He goes further east, away from the presence of God. And he settles in a place that means wandering. So that's the pattern of Scripture. And by the time you get to Genesis 11, what happens? Well, Genesis 11 is after the flood. We know that. And we read this. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, there's your connection to Cain, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. Think about this. There's just been a global flood. Instead of going back to the Lord and repenting, this group of people continues to go east, and they find the lowest plain that they could possibly find, and they build a tower, basically saying, God, I dare you to do it again. How rebellious. We call this the Tower of Babel. And once again, we see the work of the Nakash, the work of rebelling against God. As they say, what? What was our purpose in doing this? We want to make a name for ourselves. And so we see the posterity of the evil one and what they do. Now, speaking of the posterity, if you go back to Genesis 4, after God lays out his punishment to Cain, we then get a genealogy. Here's the important part. Never ever ignore the genealogies in Scripture. There's still Scripture, right? God has them there for a reason. We're going to see that in a minute, but never ignore them. They're vitally important. Verse 17. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And when he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mahujiel, and Mahujiel fathered Methushiel, and Methushiel fathered Lamech. These were not good men. And the seventh from Adam, we know that the, in the Bible, the number seven is the number of completion. So think about this. The seventh from Adam through the line of Cain is this last guy named Lamech. And in him, we see how things have gone from bad to worse. Here's what Lamech says. He said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's revenge is 77-fold. So his great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather Cain killed his own brother out of jealousy and anger, and so his identity was marred by violence. But here, generations later, later in this completion, his lineage is now marked by violence, not just marred by it. That's his legacy. But thankfully, again, that's not the end of the story, because we have verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth, for she said... God has appointed me for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. And at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So even after this almost Shakespearean tragedy between these two brothers, God is faithful. This line will continue. The promise is not dead. The promise of the offspring that will crush the head of the serpent is very much alive and well. Because it's God. And notice that this time, it's interesting, that Eve has learned a little bit. She knows that Cain is of the evil one, calls him a murderer, so he can't be the promised one. She knows that Abel is dead, so he can't be the promised one. 
And remember when, when Cain was born, she declared this, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Who did it? She did it. God just helped. And now when Seth is born, she states, God has appointed me another offspring instead of Abel. See, she's learned in this time. It's not I've gotten a man, it's God appointed for me a man. And obviously, in case you're wondering, Seth's name means like the word appointed. That's what it sounds like. So this, of course, is entirely appropriate because even though Eve maybe thinks that Seth is the appointed one, the, the uh, promised seed, and we know that he is not, we know that it was appointed that this righteous line would now continue through Seth. That's why his birth is so important. Now, I gave you the seventh from Adam in Cain's line. Here's in contrast the seventh from Adam in Seth's line. It goes Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahaliel, Jared, and Enoch. Now, if seven is the number of completeness, then the completion of that first family following Cain is death. Remember Lamech? Oddly enough, the completeness of the line of Seth is Enoch, who never died. How remarkable is that, the story that God is telling us? One ends up marked by violence and death, the other one never dies. However, even though this promise of an offspring continues, the world in general at this time is getting worse and worse. So much so that by the time we get to Genesis 6, which I know is a disputed chapter, and no matter what view you take of the sons of God and the Nephilim and all that, whatever was going on, we can all conclude that it was very, very evil. So much so that God decides to carry out justice again and flood the earth. And some of the question that's naturally asked by the Jews who are reading this for the first time, who didn't have the benefit of the story as we do, is, well, is this the end then? Will God wipe out mankind, extinguishing his promise? No, because we find that God has a man named Noah who finds favor in his eyes. So one might think, well, then surely this is the end of the offspring of the Nakash, the serpent. But no. Even after the flood, rebellion continues in one of Noah's sons named Ham and the lewd evilness that he committed. Now, I mentioned the Tower of Babel earlier, and I noted that once again, in rebellion, the offspring of the evil one would continue to declare their independence from God and make a name for themselves. That brings us back to the Tower of Babel. But the promise of God, the promise of that offspring, is still in effect. And so while the human population is trying to prove their autonomy, and independence from God by not fulfilling the command that God promised or commanded, which is to be fruitful and populate the earth, and instead finding, finding that lowest plane they could and build a tower to uh, obstruct God's name, God comes all the way down from heaven to see this great thing that mankind has built, and he disperses mankind all over the earth. And in irony, he still carries on this promise through Noah's son, Shem. Now, why do I mention Shem? Because Shem means name. You want to make a name for yourself? I'm going to take Shem, my name, and make my name for myself. And you'll see the wonder of it. Out of Shem, we eventually get a pagan worshiper you may have heard of, a man dwelling in the midst of great evil, and we call him Abram. Is God really going to do this? Can, can he continue this promise to this pagan worshiping guy named Abram? You bet. Because the promise of God continues, sometimes, most oftentimes, in a way that you don't expect. So later, of course, God makes a covenant with newly named Abraham, one that would seemingly cement the promise of the coming offspring. Abram means exalted father, and God changed his name, like, no, you're going to be exalted father of many nations. That promise is going to continue through your family, Abraham. Not only that, but the land would be given to you. Cain was a wanderer. But I'm going to bring back people to the land and let them settle there. Quite in contrast to Cain, who was a wanderer, or should have been for his life. And yet, even now, we have this promise, and the war on mankind by the Nakash still continues. Israel, the man, not the country, the man, the grandson of Abraham and his family, through extraordinary cir circumstances, end up in a place called Egypt. And in Egypt, we find out that terrible things happen. And once again, we're going to see the wiles of Satan trying to destroy this promise. Remember, the promise in Genesis 3 is based on childbearing. And we have an exodus, an attempt by the evil one to wipe out that promise. Listen to this in Exodus 1. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but, every, but you shall let every daughter live. 
So whether he knew it or not, what Pharaoh was doing was enacting the Nakash's plan to wipe him all out and destroy this baby boy. However, God still keeps his promise. For through providence, he saved one of these Hebrew boys who would grow up to be the man that we know as Moses. And he used Moses to deliver his people. He was God's instrument. And God wouldn't forget. We read in chapter 2 of Exodus, And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. So God meets with this deliverer, his hand-picked chosen one, at the scene of the burning bush. And those of you that know me know that Exodus 3 happens to be my favorite chapter in all of, all of Scripture. And I think it's part of the problem I was thinking about this this week with, with Christianity today and just the world in general. See, when Moses saw the Lord and talked to them at the burning bush, and if you read the text, read it again, he sees someone in the bush. But as he talks to him, he's told, do not come near, take your sandals off, you're standing on holy ground. And Moses is in awe. We think about it, wow, what, a, what an incredible scene. But so many today don't take God at his promises. They play with him. They've lost a sense of his righteousness and holiness. We can count on God's promise because he's righteous and holy. We know that, right? And so many today would gladly roast marshmallows in their burning bush that submit to the God who was in the burning bush. And so the war rages on. Adam was driven from the garden, his dwelling place. Cain was even further. And God would still give the godly a place. He would bring them back to a sanctuary. He promises Moses, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. He's going to bring them back. But who is this Lord who talked and walked with Adam and Eve in the garden? The same God. Well, I personally think it's the second person of the Trinity. And God reveals his covenant name to Moses during this episode. Who, who do I say sent me? You say, I am Yahweh, that great covenant name. We can trust in God because God is a covenant-keeping God. But it would not be easy for God's people, this line of the offspring of the woman, to conquer the land that he has promised. And we find that if you go through Scripture, indeed, even after they're delivered, they run into the offspring of the Nakash as they spy out the land. They just don't go away. And we see, once again, remnants of that Genesis 6 as the spies report back to Moses this. Now listen to this. We are unable to go up against that people. They are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. I feel for these guys. I can identify with them. <laughs> and there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who were these giant men who came from the Nephilim, and we seemed to, to them like, our, like grasshoppers. And we seem to them, to us, ourselves, as grasshoppers. And so then, of course, we see in the history a literal holy war playing out that we call the giant wars as they move into the future with Israel's fighting to get into the land. And once they're there, they continue to have wars because they don't get the job done. And so you have these remnants left of these people. And so they're removed, they're brought back, they're removed, they're brought back. All the while, as the seed of the Nakash wages war on the promised seed of the woman. And so the entire Old Testament history of Israel is, is littered with this theme of this war, of the good and the righteous against the evil and those opposed to God. This promise that the offspring would finally crush the head of the serpent. And all the while, as they're going through this, God is constantly reminding them throughout their history of what's coming. Isaiah tells us that the seed will be a suffering servant. Jeremiah brings us the good news of the coming covenant with its better mediator. Ezekiel promises that the seed will give new hearts. Daniel reminds us that the spiritual forces of darkness are still in play when he says that the princes, when the prince of Persia will stood him 21 days. But he also tells us of the coming kingdom, that one day all peoples and nations and languages would serve him. Hosea speaks to God's faithfulness, that he will not abandon his promise or his people, that indeed out of Egypt I have called my son. Joel gives us a wisdom, a, a wisdom and a vision of the day of the Lord, that when the head of the serpent would be crushed, the spirit would be poured out. 
Amos instructs us that God is a just God who must punish sin. But then he sees the seed. Amos has this vision of the Lord standing beside the altar who will raise up the booth of David that was knocked down. Indeed, he says, I will plant them on their land. They shall never again be uprooted. Obadiah ends with the promise that the kingdom shall be the Lord's. It will belong to him. Cain left the presence of the Lord and Jonah tried to flee from the presence of the Lord only to be pursued and demonstrate the compassion of God. Micah returns us to the promised seed and gives us very specific information on where this offspring would come from. This little town called Bethlehem. Nahum praises the feet of him who brings the good news of this coming one, who publishes peace. And then the kingdom of peace, Habakkuk, declares that those who belong to the seed of the woman, the righteous, shall live by the offspring's faith. Through Zephaniah, God promises to deal with the oppressors of his people, that he will save the lame, that his people will be be gathered together, and that the righteous blood like that of Abel, that is spilled, will not go unnoticed. Haggai promises that the great covenant made with King David will continue, that the seed will proceed from that line, and then he seals it with a signet ring, who we call Zerubbabel. Zechariah gives us a sign of when peace is near, as the seed comes, righteous, having salvation, humble, that he would be mounted on a donkey. And Malachi reminds us that God promised all the way back in the first chapters of Genesis that the Lord would make his name known and says, My name will be great among the nations, for I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts. That's a military term. And my name will be feared among the nations. But if you're God's people, you're thinking, great, but when? We're all too cranky sometimes when we want good news. You keep telling us this, you keep telling us this is for our good, where is it? Where is he? When will this promised seed of the woman come? So many types and promises and foreshadowings and visions, but when? How? The war rages on. Do you not notice this, God? I say again, praise God for genealogies and Luke 3. For now, in this nowhere town, not in a palace, but in a manger, a child is born. Yeah, I'm going to read all the names. I want you to hear this. A child who was the son of Joseph, who was the son of Haley, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Elsie, the son of Nagai, the son of Moth, the son of Matthias, the son of Simeon, the son of Josek, the son of Jodah, the son of Joannan, the son of Risa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adai, the son of Kosum, the son of Elmadam, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer, the son of Joram, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Simon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Malaya, the son of Menah, the son of Mathada, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salah, the son of Nashan, the son of Aminadab, the son of Admon, the son of Arni, the son of Ezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Nisarug, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Erechad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of God, the son of Adam, the son of God. You know why God gives us genealogies? To prove what he said was true. The offspring, the seed of the woman was here. All of heaven knew it. Those who fell from heaven knew it. The Nakash knew it. And he knew what it meant. We're in trouble. The promised seed was here to redeem what had been lost, to gain access back to what was forbidden, a better garden. And on one side, the enemy had done everything they could to stop it. Mass murder, deception, enslavement, working disobedience in the people, fear, 
And now, all agents would be deployed against this seed. As one of Jesus' apostles would later write this, Let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. And whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. See, Jesus took this battle upon himself. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. You see the language that's continually bringing us back to Genesis 3 and 4? And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. This is the enmity between the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman. The Lord Jesus Christ came to end the war. Like his human ancestor Adam, Satan would tempt him, but unlike his forefather Adam, he would not fail. He entered the world the same way that Adam left it. He endured the wandering aspect of Cain's punishment because he had nowhere to lay his head. He would be confronted with supernatural entities of darkness and he would drive them back. He would be questioned and plotted against by those of the evil one. Nobody says in John 8, that sums it up perfectly. You are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Notice how he links the situation back to Genesis 3. But whence would come that fatal blow that would strike and crush the head of the serpent? The way that he would win the war is not the way that I think we think he should win the war. He would win it by appearing to lose. He won by offering his life upon the cross. He won by dying. Then a cost that serpent of old thought he had won again by counting on God's justice. If this man was going to associate with sinners, then Lord, destroy him like he is one. And although I'm sure the scripture doesn't say it, I'm willing to bet that all the demons and the heavenly fallen creatures and the supernatural entities opposed to him of evil, they watched the Savior's body go lifeless and they put up and put into the ground and they put up a tremendous roar. But three days later, the hammer fell and the earth shook as the stone rolled away and he who did not deserve to die sprang forth from the grave. Amen? Justice had been served. Justification had been achieved. And now that power which raised him from the dead raises men from spiritual death even this morning. He claims them as his own. He enlists them into his army as a royal priesthood, into an everlasting kingdom, and they march on, and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. In the beginning, I alluded to that great verse in Hebrews which states this, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. How does the sprinkled blood of Christ speak a better word than the blood of Abel? Because the blood of Abel cried out to God from the ground for justice. But the blood of Christ speaks a better word because that word that it speaks is forgiveness. Abel's blood cried out for justice to be served, and justice was served ironically on the very seat of the woman who was going to deliver them from death. And so our Lord Jesus, as he hung on the cross and died, and because of that, his blood now speaks of forgiveness. And why? Because justice has been served in the Holy One. Forgiveness for all those who would call the name of the Lord like they did in the time of Enosh, Seth's son. But this is important. I want you to make no mistake about this. Every single person sitting in this room is on one of these sides. Either you are of the seat of the Nakash or you're of the seat of the woman. There is no neutral ground. And what must take place then is a new birth, a new life given to be born of that spiritual line, born of the Spirit, to be born of God. And then as Peter writes, you will have been born again, not of perishable seed, 
but of imperishable by the Holy Spirit to the living and abiding word of God. So his invite is, come, come join the king's army. Logan last week asked what we were willing to endure for the sake of Christ, and the answer better be your life. Because one way or the other, it's a vapor. Either it will be destroyed, or you will give it up. Make no mistake, while the decisive blow was dealt to the head of the serpent on the cross, the field of battle must still be cleared. Those on the side of evil know they've been beaten, and that's why they rage so terribly. Immediately after John writes that we should not be like Cain, he writes this, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. And somehow we still are. I can't believe how they're treating Christians. Why are you surprised? That's how they've been doing it since Genesis 3. So I'm not sure what war you were thinking about when I started describing it. But this isn't about Republicans and Democrats and conservatives and liberals and mass and no mass and capitalism and socialism. Now, those things are important in their own time and in their own way. But this war concerns our very souls. The Bible tells us to be sober-minded, to be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in your faith. Spurgeon said this, Satan can never be content until he sees the believer utterly destroyed. He would rend him in pieces and break his bones and utterly destroy him if he could. Do not therefore indulge the thought that the main purpose of Satan is to make you miserable. Anybody think I would forget a Spurgeon quote? The war has been decided, but the enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman is very much alive. We see it. Paul writes this, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of who? The government? Your neighbor? Your boss? Your siblings? No. The schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Friends, there's more going on than what we just see on the news, okay? There's a war that's been going on for thousands of years. And we know that one final battle is to come. The Bible tells us this at the end of time. And even now, smaller battles are being fought that we don't even think as battles. The elders and I talk to people and we've heard of darkness and depression, cancer, ill treatment, unrest, anxiousness, financial burdens, whatever it is. And so I urge you not to lose sight of the great battle in light of these smaller ones. Rest in the hope that the decisive blow has been given on the cross. And once the field has been cleared and the traitors have been tried and the wicked are punished, Then what was lost in the garden will be reclaimed and given back. Man was driven out of God's sanctuary, so I cannot say in these unprecedented times, because they surely have been precedented. But one day there will be an unprecedented time. A voice will be heard from the throne. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Christ has won the war. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Pray. Father, we thank you for this word that you've opened up to us. We thank you for the great story, your story in the Bible, of the righteous and the unrighteous, the seed of the woman who we know as Jesus Christ, who has crushed the head of our enemy and who has raised us up in life with him because of his death. Thank you for our justification. Keep these things in our minds as we go about our day, that we are not just concerned with the news. We are not just concerned with what's going on in our little circle. But there is a cosmic battle being played out in cosmic geography, and we know who the winner is. So let us stand firm in that faith. And I pray these things in the name of your Son, our faithful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.